We're going to be looking at Roman Catholicism part two. And uh, just going through the Christian soldiers' battle notes. And we're on page 141. Just going to walk through that. Um, just talking about the different cults and sects and fake religions. Mentioned those, but especially Roman Catholicism, which is anti-Christ, anti-scriptural. And we're going to be looking at this evening. The errors of Roman Catholicism. We're going to look at some of those errors. The Catholic Church, from its private, or first private, interpretations. Now turn to 2 Peter 1 verse 20, and somebody like to read that out loud. 2 Peter 1 verse 20. No prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. The Catholic Church interprets the scriptures privately and they come up with all kinds of man-made doctrines, which again we'll get down <clears throat> there uh, a little bit later on, if not tonight, down the line sometime. But the Catholic Church, from its first private interpretation by Augustine, Cyprian and Irenaeus, Irenaeus to those of the Council of Trent, AD 1546, has, has been consistent in one thing. They rest and they pervert the word of God. The Roman Catholics rest and pervert the word of God. Now, turn to 2 Peter 3, 16. 2 Peter 3, 16. <clears throat> and all cults and false religions do this, as also in all his epistles, who's writing, Peter, and he's saying about Paul's epistles, speaking in them of, thing, of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. Peter's saying about Paul's epistles. Isn't that interesting? Which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. So if you pull verses out of context, you rest the scriptures, if you try and twist them to make them fit, you'll rest them and um, it'll be to your own destruction. And hence why we've got so many cults and false religions that are doing this, especially Roman Catholicism, which we're looking at tonight. The Jehovah's Witnesses do it. Um, I've just been studying today with regard to Revelation chapter 7. And in regard to the 144,000, they've rested it to their own destruction. They've taken this verse to apply to the Jehovah's Witnesses. 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses in heaven. I mean, how mad is that? And uh, so the, the Seventh-day Adventists do it with the Sabbath. Um, um, Mormons do it, to add to the scripture. Christadelphians do it. All the cults do it. And so do these religions. So Roman Catholicism, they corrupt the word of God. Turn to 2, Peter, so, sorry, 2 Corinthians 2. They rest the scriptures. They twist them, they distort them, they pull them out of context, they take things out of the Bible, they add things to the Bible. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 17. These are great scriptures. Verse 17. Now the Lord is that... No, that's 2 Corinthians 3, sorry. Seven, verse 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, as of God in the sight of God speak we in Christ. So even in Paul's day, you think about that. Paul's writing this. We are not as many which corrupt the word of God. That's in Paul's day. Now you think we're in 2017, how this book, how they've taken the word of God and they've corrupted it. You know, you've got all these 200 odd version Bibles. You've got all these um, extra religious books. You've got the, the Catholics, which they teach their dogma. You've got people adding to the book taking away from it and pulling things out of context. So people are trying to corrupt this book, and Satan is the ultimate um, behind it all, obviously, trying to corrupt the word of God. They can't get rid of it, so they've got to corrupt it. They've got to water it down. And then look at 2 Corinthians 4, verse 2. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Handling the word of God deceitfully? Well, according to the, I've had some dealings with this, what, Sam Shamoon, whatever he is, this um, overweight windbag, and um, he's been on about uh, what he does and how he's a biblical apologist and all this kind of stuff, and he's had a crack at me the last couple of times or the last couple of weeks it is, and um, the, these people like him and David Wood, they're brilliant at de debating Muslims, but they're useless at the authority of scripture. They have no final authority. 
And so what I try to point out to him, it would be helpful for him in his arguments and his debates if he had a final authority that, he could, that was perfect, that he could trust in and say, thus saith the Lord because it is written, rather than going some modern perversion like he uses the NIV, which says that Jesus was kicked out of heaven in Isaiah 14, 12, is it? Missed out the blood in Acts 8, verse 37, um, Colossians 1, 14. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, removes that from Acts 8, 37. All these verses that are missing out and distorted and twisted... And, he's in, and then, in one breath, he's saying the word of God is perfect. And so he was up against a Muslim, Ali Shabi Ladi, whatever his name is. And, um, and the Muslim collared him and said, you've changed the Bible so many times, you don't know what, what's right or wrong. And he had no answer to this. He's trying to take a, a stand on the perfection of scripture. And he got caned by this Muslim over in this debate. And so I was trying to point this out, but he wasn't having it. He's just an arrogant yobbo. But anyway, so they corrupt the word of God, and people are doing that today all over the place. If you go into Christian bookshops, which are a joke these days, um, they hardly they hardly ever sell King James Bibles. They sell all the different perverted stuff. Jeremiah 23, turn there. Jeremiah 23. <clears throat> We're looking at Roman Catholicism, but just looking at a few scriptures in the introduction. Jeremiah 23, verse 36. And the burden of the Lord shall ye mention no more, for every man's word shall be his burden. For ye have perverted the words of the living God, of the Lord of hosts, our God. Ye have perverted the words of the living God. If you're not reading a King James Bible, you've got a book that has perverted the words of the living God. So the Catholic Church, from its first private interpretations by Augustine, Cyprian and Irenaeus, to those of the Council of Trent, AD 1546, has been consistent in one thing, resting and perverting the word of God in an effort to force it to approve of her own heresies and traditions. Catholics are taught that anything written or preached contrary to to the teachings and traditions of the Vatican State is a lie. Even if Paul, Jesus or Moses said it, if it doesn't go with their dogma and their traditions of this Vatican State, it's a lie. Imagine that, putting tradition above the word of God. Your final authority is your traditions. Turn to Mark 7 again. Verse 13, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition which ye have delivered and many such like things ye do. Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition. It's what the Bible says that matters. It should be our final authority on everything, on all matters of faith and prayer. It should be. Not tradition. So let's look at a few of these errors of the Roman Catholics. First of all, Peter was not the first Pope, as the Roman Catholics teach. Can you believe this? We went to Rome on our honeymoon, and um, I look back on those happy days, <laughs> beautiful days, and um, I went there because I saw a Roman holiday, and I thought it would be romantic to take my wife there and sit on the Spanish steps. But we had good chances to witness all kinds of different people over there. But then we went into this, um, the Vatican State, St. Peter's Basilica, and uh, it is an amazing building, impressive architecture, amazing, the paintings, all this. And, um, and we had a good look round it. And we saw the different confessionals in there, the people lining up in all kinds of different languages to in their confessions. I'm thinking, this is all extra-biblical, anti-scriptural, and you just can't believe they've distorted the word of God and they've put their own traditions on it and they've just made this massive, great building into like a headquarters and the Catholic Church has like, infiltrated every you know, section of life, really, all over the world. And it is amazing how it's taken over countries and um, this, this powerful, anti-Christian, fake, satanic religion. Peter was certainly not the first pope, as the Roman Catholics teach. When we were on a bus tour in Rome, uh, the lady giving the lecture, she was saying how that the, uh, Peter was the first pope and that, and we were just smiling, thinking, you know, they just regurgitate this stuff. Turn to Matthew 16, verse 17 and 18. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood 
hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. A little cross-reference there of John 1.42, before we comment on that, John 1.42, which says... And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. So was he a rock or a stone? Well, we've gone through that debate, that um, study before. Jesus Christ is the rock. Peter is a stone. But then again, Jesus Christ is the chief corner stone. Uh, But we've done that in other studies. But here, this passage is given before, notice, before the resurrection. Before the resurrection, by a Jew, to a Jewish audience, as the minister of circumcision. Here's an interesting verse for you. Romans 15, turn there, Romans 15, verse 8. Romans 15, this is a Bible study tonight, on Roman Catholicism, a satanic, fake religion. Romans 15, verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. For the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. So in Matthew 16, verse 17 and 18, this passage is given before the resurrection by a Jew to a Jewish audience as the minister of circumcision. So straight away, the Roman Catholics have overlooked the epistles written to the church by the apostle to the Gentiles who preached in Rome. Rome. Who was that? The minister to the Gentiles, the apostle to the Gentiles. Was that Peter? No. That was Paul. Instead of starting with Ephesians, Colossians and Timothy, the Roman Catholics begin in pre-crucifixion passages addressed to Jews. And we've said if you're going to take all kinds of heresies that come, um, are mainly taken from books that are directed to the Jew or pre-crucifixion passages. Because doctrinally you're still standing in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, until the death of the testator, which launches the New Covenant. So instead of starting with Ephesians, Colossians and Timothy, the Roman Catholics believe, uh, believe begin in a pre-crucifixion passage addressed to Jews. And all heresies, or nearly all heresies, come from the books of the Bible that are directed to the Jew. Matthew, Hebrews... James and Acts. And Acts, which is a book of transition, a book in transit, which means moving from one place to another, and that's what Acts is. Acts is a book of transit, moving from the nation of Israel to individual believers. From the law to grace. From Jews to Gentiles. From the apostle to the circumcision, Peter. Moving from him in the first, what is it, twelve chapters and then going to the apostle to the Gentiles, Paul. From the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. And so why is it that so many Pentecostal and charismatic Christians claim scriptures for themselves that are directed at the Jew? The sign gifts are for the Jews. Tongues, healings, Sabbath keeping. It's for the Jews, not for the church. Turn to 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 22. Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. Tongues are for a sign. 1 Corinthians 1, 22. The Jews require a sign. 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians 12. Verse 12. Truly the signs of an apostle signs of an apostle turn to the book of acts what's the title of the book of acts the acts of the apostles if you don't get that you're going to claim stuff for yourself that's not directed to you the acts of the apostles turn to mark 16 don't claim scripture that isn't targeted or directed to you doctrinally You'll mess up. Verse 15, he said unto them. Who's the them? 
The apostles, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs, the signs of an apostle, shall follow them, the apostles that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They, who's the they, shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Who's it talking about? The apostles. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, the apostles, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God, and they, the apostles, went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, the apostles, and confirming the word with signs following. Man alive. Signs of an apostle. Was it in Revelation 2? Um, was it says about uh, saying they're apostles and are not? Is it Revelation 2, verse 2? I know thy works and thy labour and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. We have no apostles. To say you have an apostle today, you're mad. We said before, in order to be an apostle, one had to have been among the Lord's disciples during his public ministry on earth, and have been a witness of his resurrection, Acts 1.22. Paul was one born out of due time, 1 Corinthians 15.8. He did see the resurrected Jesus, Acts 9, 2 Corinthians 5.16. And it's only Stephen and Paul that have seen Jesus since the day he ascended, Acts 1.21 and 22, Acts 10.39 to 41. So don't claim signs that are not directed to you. You'll only mess up in your doctrine, in the scripture. It's not rightly dividing the word of truth. So to understand the scriptures correctly, we need to be able to rightly divide them. 2 Timothy 15, 2 Timothy 2, 15. And you must compare scripture with scripture, not private interpretation, scripture with scripture to get the meaning and context. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 13 is that saying, I think that's this, is it spiritual with spiritual? Scripture with scripture. It's a spiritual book. 1 Corinthians 2.13. Yes, it's comparing uh, spiritual things with spiritual. Scripture is not to be interpreted privately. And notice who said that. Peter. The first pope. <laughs> Notice who does interpret the scriptures in their own private way. Rome. And the Roman Catholics say that Peter was the first pope. But what do the scriptures tell us about Peter? That's why it's good to look at Romans 4.3, Galatians 4.30, which says, What saith scripture? What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say on this matter? Whatever your issue you're dealing with, what saith the scripture? Well, let's look at this, just for a second, about Peter. Matthew 8.14. <coughs> Matthew 8, this always makes me smile, this one. Matthew 8, 14. As when Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. He saw his wife's mother... He saw his wife? Wife? Peter was married? Poor bloke. Peter was married? Well, popes can't be married. How can he be a pope? Peter's wife's mother, that's a mother-in-law, isn't it? Was sick. So is mine. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. No, I'm joking. No, I don't mean that in a bad way. Donna's looking at me. I'm joking. She's a good girl, she is. Oh, don't shake your head, Lizzie. <laughs> I'm joking. Tell you. Don't look. <laughs> Matthew eight fourteen. His what? His wife's mother. Wife. I thought Roman Catholics said popes can't marry. The scriptures teach that Peter was married. Look at Mark one. Turn there. Mark chapter one. Mark chapter one, verse twenty nine to thirty one. And they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority, and not as the scribes. 
And there was in the synagogue a man that, with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone, what have I to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region about, round about Galilee. And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon the, and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother, there it is again, lay sick of the fever, and then I'm they tell her of. So he was married. Peter was married. So he couldn't have been a pope. Matthew 16, turn there. Matthew 16, verse 23. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. It's a nice way of talking to a pope, isn't it? <laughs> Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art, thou art an offence unto me. For thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. What about that? Peter the first pope being called Satan by the Lord Jesus Christ himself? See also the first pope swears. That's what I like. Good old Peter. (laughs) Matthew 26. Complain about his language, are you? Matthew 26, verse 74. Then began he, Peter, to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man, and immediately the cock grow. He swears. Acts 10, turn there. What a great example this Pope is. Acts 10. Acts 10, verse 25 and 26. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. How about these verses for a contrast between Peter and the Pope. So far, we have the first Pope who is married. He curses. He's mistaken. He's a satanic believer, he's called, who would not let men bow down to him. Peter wouldn't let anybody bow down to him. Pope lets him kiss his his feet. Peter says, get up, I'm just a man. Not very good qualifications for a Pope, are they? Oh, and the other thing, Peter never went to Rome. How mad is that? They reckon they've got Peter's bones in the Vatican, don't they? What a load of old tosh that is. Peter never went to Rome, according to the scriptures. Also, when Peter wrote to Christians and defined the rock, in Matthew 16, 17, 18, 16, verse 17, 18, he said that the rock was Christ and not himself. Turn to 1 Peter 2. Don't you think the Roman Catholics have distorted the word of God? Change the word of God to suit their own heresies and traditions. 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter 2. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter my opinion, your opinion. It matters what this book says. 1 Peter 2, verse 4 to 9. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold I lay in Zion a chief corner stone, elect, precious And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offence. Even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient. Wherefore, whereunto, also they were appointed. Christ is the rock. Not Peter. 1 Corinthians 10. Jesus Christ is the rock. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4. And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock, capital R, that followed them. And that rock, capital R, was Christ. 
You mess up and put Peter as the rock, you've got big problems. Look at Romans 9. Romans 9. Go with scripture. Let's talk scripture. What the Bible says. Not what you think. Not what religion teaches. Not traditions of men. Let's see what the Bible says. The scriptures. Romans 9 verse 33. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offence, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. There's a very interesting verse in Deuteronomy 32. Turn there. Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32, verse 31. For their rock is not as... Our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their rock, that's the Roman Catholics, is not as our rock. Capital R. The Catholics have a different rock. Not ours. Not the Lord Jesus Christ. In the scriptures, Peter is a stone, not a rock. John 1.42 The Lord Jesus Christ will build his church, not Peter. Jesus Christ will build his church, not Peter. Turn to Matthew 16, 18 again. Matthew 16, verse 18. And I say unto thee, thou thou art Peter, and upon this rock, Jesus Christ, I will build my church, Jesus Christ, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. There's so much confusion today. You look on YouTube and everybody reckons they know everything and all, everybody says different things. Listen, it's what the Bible says. Don't change it, just believe it. Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23. And I've put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, Jesus Christ, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. I was looking today at, uh, again, I have to go through some of this stuff because things come up and people ask questions and looking at this hyper-dispensational stuff and they've got to have, because they distort the scriptures and they say all kinds of ridiculous things, they rest the scriptures to their own destruction. They believe that there's a, up until Acts 1 to Acts 9, there was one body, and then Acts 9 onwards there's another body. So they've got to have two different bodies when even though the scriptures talk about the one body. Don't Chop up the Bible like the hypers do. Read it, compare scripture with scripture, rightly divide it, and you won't have a problem. Look at Colossians 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. The church is his body. It is his body. He builds it. It is certainly not the Roman Catholic, satanic, counterfeit church. Religion is a detestable, horrible thing. Whether it's all this Greek Orthodox, or it's Roman Catholicism, which is, you know, um, or the Anglicans, with all this gold and these... I mean, the buildings are lovely, stained glass windows, but it's dead. They're like Somebody said once, they're like museums. They may have these magnificent buildings, which there wasn't in the New Testament, but then these magnificent buildings with all this gold and all this um, stuff in them, but they're dead. There's no life in them. They're just museums. What does Rome say about Peter? We're looking at Peter. What does Rome say about Peter, the so-called first pope? And what do they say about the church? This is taken from the canons and dogmatic degree, decrees of the Council of Trent. Listen to this. I acknowledge the holy Catholic and apostolic Roman church as the mother and teacher of all churches. And I promise and swear true obedience to the Roman pontiff, the vicar of Christ and successor of blessed Peter. Prince. 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 Scripture back up. No scripture on any of this. Prince of the Apostles. The Roman pontiff is the true vicar of Christ and the head of the whole church and the father and teacher of all Christians. The Roman pontiff speaks ex cathedra. Ex cathedra means with the full authority of office, especially that of the Pope, implying infallibility as defined in Roman Catholic doctrine. Origin. 
Latin, from the teacher's chair, are in, I- irreformable of themselves. Where Jesus is the Christian's invisible head, no longer in the flesh, the Pope claims to be the Christian's head, still in the flesh. Without a doubt, Roman Catholicism doesn't follow scripture, in context, if at all, at times. They have their own private interpretations, and we know what scripture says about that, as we've read in 2 Peter 1.20, 2 Peter 3.16. To think that the Pope penned both of those scriptures, how about that? (laughs) I don't think so. I don't think so. So the Bible, let's look at just a few things here in comparison. The Bible with no interpretation. Peter is a Jew who confesses Christ and his promised keys to a kingdom. Paul is the God-called and God-commissioned apostle to the Gentiles, to whom alone was revealed the mystery of the church in this age and who straightened Peter out on his false doctrine in Galatians 2. Paul straightened Peter out. But Rome says, with her own private interpretation, that Peter is a Catholic, the first Pope who has promised the keys of heaven. Peter is the Prince of Apostles, and therefore infallible in matters of church doctrine for the Roman Catholics. What about the church? The church is Christ's church, and is a living body into which a man has to be born again by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Turn to 1 Corinthians 12. This is what we back it up with scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. For by one spirit are we all baptised into one body. How do you become a member of the body of Christ? You're baptised by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ at conversion. The moment you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you're baptised into the body of Christ. What does Roman Catholics teach? The Roman Catholicism... The religion teaches about the church. The church is the Roman sea, S-double-E, and sea is the place in which a cathedral church stands, identified as the seat of authority of a bishop or archbishop at the Vatican. The head of all Catholics who are baptised by water into the universal Roman church. The Roman Catholics can lose his salvation or their salvation at any time, therefore he must continue to work for it. Isn't there a difference? They have to work for their salvation. They don't know if they're saved. And then they have the last rites, don't they? And they prayed over and they get their, was it purple thing out? The priest does, lays it over there or on them. And they give them the last rites and they're baptized, all this stuff. Well, according to the Bible, the rock is Jesus Christ. We've looked at the scriptures on that. According to Roman Catholicism, the rock is Peter the first Pope. The Bible... Well, nine-tenths of the New Testament is written in Asia Minor, not Rome. And Paul never mentions Peter directly or indirectly when writing to the Roman church. That's interesting. But according to Roman Catholicism, the Bible, well, they add, they subtract, they change, they distort the scriptures to suit themselves. Roman Catholics, tradition is put on a par with the scriptures and oftentimes overrules the scriptures. Let's look at just a couple more. The Roman Catholics' erroneous interpretation of Matthew 16. Turn there. Matthew 16. Matthew 16, verse 19. And I will give unto thee the keys... In fact, we'll go verse 18 again. I say unto thee, also unto thee, thou, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The kingdom of heaven in scripture is always Jewish. It's never Roman. It's always Davidic. It's never Popish. It's always in a mystery form until the second advent. Never in a visible or political form. It's always in earthly form. It's always, always is earthly and literal, never spiritual or heavenly. There's a difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Again, we've covered that a number of times. Peter or Paul? Peter had no authority whatsoever over Paul, anywhere in the New Testament at any time. And Paul was the apostle to the Romans, Romans 15. Let's look at some more errors of the Roman Catholic Church. What is the mass? What is the Mass? 
The mass is a mess. <laughs> what is the mass? The mass, according to the Roman Catholic Church, is the unbloody sacrifice of the body and blood of Christ. Is the mass the same sacrifice as that of the cross? The Roman Catholic Church, the mass is the same sacrifice as that of the cross. This is anti-scriptural. This goes against scripture. Turn to Hebrews. The mass is the same sacrifice as that of the cross. You really believe when you hold that host up and that wafer and you drink that um, alcoholic beverage (laughs) um, that you really turn in that bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus Christ? Yes, they do. Hebrews chapter 7. Look at this. Hebrews 7 verse 27. Hebrews 7, verse 27. Who needeth not daily as though those high priests to offer up sacrifice for his own sins and then for the people's? For this he did once, once, when he offered up himself. He didn't have to offer himself up again. You don't have to do it on a Sunday in the Catholic Church. That bread and wine does not become the body and blood of Jesus Christ. It's not literal. When we have communion on a Sunday and we have the crackers and the grape juice and we pass it around, that is not the body and blood of Christ, literally. We do this in remembrance. They're symbols, symbolic emblems. Hebrews 9, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 to 15. Look at this. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. See the Trinity there? Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Verse 26. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That means you don't do it again. You don't have to keep repeating this every Sunday in a Catholic church. Verse 28, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Look at Hebrews 10, verse 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices every Sunday which can never take away sins. But this man, the Lord Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever sat down on the right hand of God. Verse 14. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Verse 18. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of of Jesus. What are you doing in a Catholic church when they sacrifice the Lord Jesus Christ every week, believing it to be the body and blood? Cannibalism, that's what it is. I told you the story before, but it's true. When I went to a Catholic church in Hereford um, on my lunch break once, and um, I had a look inside and there were two ladies down the front of the church and I just went out and chat with them. And um, I said, do you really believe that the, the bread and the wine becomes the body and the blood of Jesus Christ? And one of them says, yes, yes we do. We do believe that. It's the actual body and the blood. I said, what happens if you drop it? What happens if you drop the body of Jesus Christ? And one, the one person said, oh, we've never done that. And the other one said, oh, I was here once when they did that. I said, so what did you do with it? Well, we swept it up. I said, then then where did you put it? They said, oh, in the dustbin. (laughs) 
the body of Jesus Christ in the dustbin. So much for that. The scriptures are perfectly clear that the Lord Jesus Christ was offered once. How many more times? We've just read it a number of times. He was offered once. They don't, we don't do it again and again like the Roman Catholics do. It was a perfect sacrifice and shall never be repeated. The Mass is not only a mess, it's a satanic ritual. That's what it is. A satanic ritual. Satan's behind it. Okay, one more. What is baptism in water? Well, the Roman Catholic Church says baptism is a sacrament which cleanses us from original sin, makes us Christians, children of God and heirs of heaven. Isn't that lovely? But unfortunately, it's not biblical. It's not scriptural. It's anti-scriptural. The thief on the cross knew nothing about baptism, yet the Lord took him to paradise without being baptised. We are saved, only saved, by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the death, burial and resurrection, the gospel. Ephesians 2 verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Again, let's have a quick run through, let's run these verses. Hebrews 9.22 Hebrews 9.22 And almost all things are by the Lord purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. 1 John 1, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. 1 John 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Where's the water baptism there? Look at Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, we're nearly through. Follow me just on these few. Ephesians 1 verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Colossians 1 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Where's water in these? You know, when it talks about justification and having your sins forgiven, justification, there's no water there. Water baptism has nothing to do, nothing to do with your salvation. We've read, I know that it's very interesting that in Hebrews 9 and 10, major parts of those chapters are taken out of the Roman Catholic Bible. The ones that say one sacrifice for sins forever. We won't read it again, but you you want to note down Hebrews 10 verse 10 to 19... Great verse, verses there. And Romans 5, I will read that to you, Romans 5. I love Roman, um, Hebrews 9 and 10, you ought to read that. Romans 5 verse 9, Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. You're justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. Another one, Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13 verse 12. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. Not water. Not baptism. Revelation 1 verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and of the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, and him that loved us and washed us from our sins by water baptism. (laughs) No, sir. By his own blood. Great verse. Three more. Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace ye say through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If it was water baptism, it would be a work. Not of works. And the last one here, 1 Peter 3, 1 Peter 3, 21. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Oh no. What are we going to do with that one? It's a figure. Baptism is a picture of what? The death, 
burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism doth also now save it. It's a picture. Not by the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the, but, answer, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Romans 6, verse 1 to 4, if you want to just have a quick look at this a second, they read this out at every baptismal service. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And these people that are, what are they, Campbellites, they called, as it, believe in water baptism for salvation, baptismal regeneration. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us were baptized as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? You're baptized into Jesus Christ. How? By water? No. As we said beforehand, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, you're baptized into the body of Christ by what? The Spirit, capital S, by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. So when it says into, baptized into Jesus Christ, it is never, never, ever, not once, water baptism into Jesus Christ. You can't get into Jesus Christ. You can't get into the body of Christ by water baptism. Water has nothing to do with it. Yet the, the Roman Catholics teach that. The Campbellites teach it. People that believe in baptismal regeneration, they teach it. The Church of Christ teach it. But this is not scripture. Not scriptural. Water has nothing to do with your salvation. Very interesting when people want to run to Acts 2.28. That only ever happened once in scripture. And there wasn't a Christian in the passage. They were Jews, all converts to Judaism. Not one Christian was in Acts chapter 2. But they keep running back to that chapter. And it only ever happened. No Gentiles were saved by Acts 2.38. No Gentile was ever saved by Acts 2.38. And in this dispensation, this dispensation of what they call grace, the Laodicean church period, you are saved only by the gospel, the death, burial and resurrection. You can only have your sins forgiven by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you asked him? If you're a hyper, you haven't. Have you asked him? So, Roman Catholicism. It's an anti-scriptural, satanic counterfeit of true biblical Christianity. Isn't it interesting? They like to take parts of the Bible and uh, cut out and chop it all up. But the parts they like, they like to dress in the long robes and the big hats. And they like all this, um, I don't know what the word is, pomp, yes? And they're very arrogant. And they're not interested in debating. They're not interested in talking or reasoning from the scriptures. They follow their own man-made traditions and put their traditions and their dogmas above the word of God. They've corrupted the word of God and they've changed it. They have their own Bibles. Some use the Jerusalem Bible, don't they? Others, I'm sure they've got their other versions as well. Whatever suits, as long as it's not like Hebrews 9 and Hebrews 10 where it talks about the one sacrifice for sins forever. They don't want any of that. They don't want the King James Bible. They want everything but the King James Bible. They burnt so many uh, Christians, you know, um, Tyndale, you know, who, who gave us much of what we have today. And uh, they have massacred and destroyed thousands, if not millions of Christians down through the ages, trying to stomp out this book, trying to um, force people into Roman Catholicism. And here we are today, free with the King James Bible in front of us reading the scriptures that is stained this book is stained with the blood of the martyrs down through the ages so you never take this book lightly we are so privileged to have a copy of the word of God and if anybody says it's got errors in you just dump them you want anything to do with them this book is perfect and I thank God that this is a, this is a, a Catholic killing machine this book this uh, King James Bible is brilliant and uh, it's perfect and I love it and uh, we stand on it, and no matter who comes against us, whether it's Jehovah's Witnesses, Christadelphians, Mormons, or the Roman Catholics, um, all the hyper-dispensational cult, whatever it is, all these modern weird stuff that's coming in, we stand upon this book, we rightly divide it, we compare scripture with scripture, and uh, that's, that's it. Nothing else, nothing more to say. I'm a happy chappy, because I've got my King James Bible, and no one's going to take that away from me. So that's a few errors of the Roman Catholics will pick up on their idolatry next, their prayers to Mary and the saints, and uh, we'll look at the word justification, what does it mean to them, what does it mean to us according to the scriptures, and that will be in part three, Lord willing.